All right, hello everyone. I'm Robert Elder. I'm a staff scientist in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the US Food and Drug Administration. Uh, today, I wanna to tell you about um, some of our work using molecular simulations to predict the diffusivity of small solute molecules in polymers. Um, so here's a disclaimer I'm required to put on the screen. You're, you're free to pause the video and read it for yourself. Um, so I work uh, in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Um, so one of the main things we deal with are medical devices. Um, so that's one of the other areas that the Food and Drug uh, Administration uh, regulates. So medical devices come in all sorts of shapes and sizes from big burly uh, hip implants to uh, tiny little contact lenses, uh, MRI machines, syringes, as well as just sort of standard tubing that you would see in the hospital. Um, so the mission of CDRH, that's the center where I work, um, is to ensure that these medical devices are both safe and effective. Now, one of the key things that we need to um, evaluate when we're determining whether a device is safe um, is whether it is biocompatible. Uh, so there are a number of things that go into biocompatibility. Um, typically, in the past, those were addressed using animal testing, but that uh, is expensive, it's time consuming, um, it's, there's also ethical concerns associated with it. So one of the goals of the center is to replace these animal tests uh, with in vitro tests or uh, computational capabilities. Um, so there are two primary uh, components of this type of, evalu of evaluation of the um, biocompatibility. The first is the exposure, uh, which is to say, um, if we implant this device in someone, how much of some sort of um, additive in the polymer or uh, additive or, um, or contaminant of the polymer uh, will come out and enter the patient. Um, the other component is uh, the toxicity, which is like how bad is it per, you know, per uh, unit mass or something like that. Um, so uh, I'm focused on the exposure assessment today. Um, so you can do this um, in vitro using chemical characterization where you basically place the device into a solvent of some sort and then you characterize uh, what types of solutes uh, extractables come out of the device. Um, uh, Another way of looking at the exposure is using physics-based models um, uh, like this, and I'll show you an example on the next slide. So here's some work from some of my colleagues at FDA. Um, so what they were doing was uh, creating this exposure model of a nitinol wire. So nitinol is a shape memory alloy made of nickel and titanium. It's a, actually a very cool material. Um, so, so it's used in things like coronary stents because it can be shrunk down very small for a non-invasive surgery um, placed by a surgeon at a particular site and then expanded um, to sort of open up, open up a vein or an artery so the blood flow can go through there. Um, the problem though is that nickel, if you have too much of it, can be toxic. So that's what uh, my colleagues here were doing was basically modeling um, the, uh, the concentration uh, over time uh, that was leaching out of this, uh, out of this nitinol wire into the serum or the blood as well as uh, the surrounding tissue. Um, and so uh, this basically just uses this simple, uh, well, relatively simple uh, Ficke and diffusion equation where you have the concentration, um, some gradients, and the diffusivity. Um, once you, um, you, know, you know, using finite element uh, modeling to solve that, uh, you can then get a mass flow rate of nickel into the body. And using a systemic model, you can see how that partitions in the body and how it's excreted. And that can be used to inform a sort of a toxicological risk assessment. So the key thing that we need uh, to be able to solve this equation is this, this diffusivity D. So uh, there are a number of ways of measuring diffusivity. Um, so you can get it experimentally using what are called sorption experiments. Um, so this is one example of this. We have a particular polymer. We, we place a little coupon of that into a solution of, of the solute of interest. This is a phthalocyanin dye. So it's, it's easy to see the dye basically leaching into the polymer. And then this is showing the weight percent, basically, you know, the absorption of that dye into the polymer. And, you know, you can fit this with this, uh, with this equation that gives you things like the diffusivity as well as the solubility. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's fine. That's fairly straightforward experiment. Um, the problem is that it takes eight months and that's just for a single uh, polymer solute combination. So really this would become prohibitive if you wanted to look at all the various combinations. There are, you know, many different solutes, many different polymers. So we're interested in finding other ways of getting this diffusivity D. So that's where um, molecular dynamics or MD simulations come in. 
Um, so MD simulations allow you basically to watch uh, molecules wiggle around and diffuse around over time. Uh, so here uh, I'm showing an example of polyvinyl acetate with just a few methanol molecules in it. This, uh, this top left uh, diagram shows the trajectory of a single uh, methanol molecule over time. And this diagram down here shows the trajectories of all the, all the methanol molecules. So you can see them kind of bouncing around and uh, diffusing over, over uh, you know, longer times. Now, if we take those trajectories and basically average them, um, we get the mean squared displacement. Um, and that is sort of these characteristic curves that you see here. So at very short times, we're in the ballistic regime where um, the, th where the uh, methanol molecules are bouncing around kind of in a little cage. Um, and then at longer times, we get to the diffusive regime with the, these characteristic slopes, t to the uh, two, t to the one. Um, but at intermediate times, uh, things are interesting. Uh, things get interesting. So we have this sort of plateau value where these molecules are somewhat trapped in their little cage until they can get out of it and start diffusing uh, at, longer, at longer times. Um, so you know, at lower temperatures, things get trapped more easily, so the uh, diffusivity is lower. Um, so we can take this mean squared displacement and essentially just divide by the time, and that gives the diffusivity over time. And at these very high temperatures, it uh, fairly rapidly reaches a constant value. Um, so this is actually the diffusivity of methanol in uh, polyvinyl acetate at these particular temperatures. Um, but at shorter times, or sorry, at uh, lower temperatures, um, these you can see these lines have not yet converged and reached a stable value. They're still kind of continuing. Um, so on the time scale of, this, of these particular simulations, which is 10 nanoseconds, we haven't reached the stable value. So we don't, we don't really know what the diffusivity is at that temperature. Um, so that's, you know, that's a problem because this is the physiological temperature where we actually, you know, we're actually uh, interested in that. Um, so I mean, these, these simulations uh, can take months on the order, you know, the same order of magnitude as, as, the, um, as the experiments. So we'd like to find some way of speeding that up, of course. So that's that's what uh, this talk is about. It's basically looking for shortcuts, um, uh, trying trying to get the uh, diffusivity at physiological temperature. So now this is showing the diffusivity um, calcul that we uh, had on the previous slide from that plot um, in that same system versus uh, inverse temperature. So up here, uh, these are these are the highest temperatures. So they converged very quickly. Uh, these sort of solid symbols, those are above the Arrhenius temperature. So that's where um, we can fit those with a sort of standard Arrhenius equation where we have an activation energy um, and we have this linear fit uh, that continues you know, down to lower temperatures. Um, below the Arrhenius temperature, we start to see this drop off um, as, as the apparent activation energy um, is increasing. And that's because we're sort of starting to approach the glass transition. So things are slowing down more and more and more. Um, and then these X's, those are showing the ones that uh, the diffusivities that have not yet converged. And you can see, you know, compared to the experiment, we're overestimate, we're, uh, you know, overestimating the diffusivity by a couple order, orders of magnitude. Um, <clears throat> so, and then I'll also point out this uh, critical or crossover temperature, uh, or rather mode coupling temperature. Um, that's basically where the glass transition really starts to get going. So things start to slow down even more um, than they were. Um, and you can kind of see that, you know, at that point, uh, the diffusivity is really starting to drop off. Um, so what my colleagues and, and others in the literature, of course, have, have looked at was uh, reframing this problem in terms of instead of temperature, looking at the Debye-Waller factor. Um, so that is a strange name, but uh, it basically just mentions the uh, cage size between hops of the molecule. So this methanol is rattling around in this cage, then it's able to jump into this one, rattle around, etc. cetera. Um, and it's defined uh, commonly as the mean squared displacement at some time, Debye Waller time, of one picosecond. So now, if I just replot that same data uh, as a function of the inverse Debye Waller time, we actually get this remarkable ability to extrapolate from these high temperature uh, short simulations down to the experimental values. And we're just we're using an exponential here in terms of um, you know just uh, different variables and fitting parameters. So this is cool because these simulations up here can be done in a matter of hours. Um, and that would, uh, this, so this potentially gives us the ability to get these uh, low temperature diffusion coefficients very quickly. So this is only for a single uh, polymer uh, solute system. So what I've done more recently is to try to generalize this to other solutes and polymers. 
Um, and so that's what I'm showing here. We've looked at a, a, sort of a couple different polymers, polyvinyl acetate and polystyrene. That gives us a range of um, polarity of the polymer. Looked at a, a wide variety of solutes from sort of non-condensable gases down to more medium-sized things, as well as to uh, really fairly heavy dyes. Um, so this gives us, you know, from, you know, from very s low molecular weight up to very high molecular weight, uh, and as well as sort of a variety of uh, polarities in here. Um, and so this uh, plot uh, on the right is showing the uh, normalized diffusion coefficient. So it's normalized by the, this fitting parameter D naught. Um, and so what, what we've done here is to take these uh, high temperature simulation results and extrapolate those using this, using this equation and extrapolate those down to lower temperatures over here. Um, so essentially uh, what we can see is that there is universal behavior at very high temperatures uh, that's well above this um, crossover temperature, which again is well above the glass transition. Um, so that's nice. Um, and then uh, below the um, below this crossover temperature, if we have uh, lower molecular weight solutes, it's actually uh, still pretty uh, fairly predictive for those, which is good. Um, and for the higher molecular weight solutes that, that are shown down here, this um, rep, this exponential represents an upper bound. Um, so that's actually potentially useful in our regulatory context because if we know the uh, the highest diffusivity that also uh, gives us the highest patient exposure the fastest leaching out of the device into the patient so that's potentially a you know useful protective upper upper limit like absolute worst case so that's that's um you know that's potentially useful but we want to be a little more predictive in that if possible. So uh, we've tried a variety of things to um, vary the way that this expression is applied to this data. Um, in, in the literature, there's sort of uh, various other ways you can try to uh, do this. Um, so this, this is just one of them. So on the previous slide, uh, what we had was this Dubai Waller time was uh, defined as one picosecond. Um, here, what I've done is to use that Debye Waller time as a fitting parameter, basically to um, fit the, the extrapolation from these simulation results and ensure that it goes through the experimental results really nicely. So, I mean, using that extra knob to improve the fit, basically that does give us an improved collapse of all these curves, which is, you know, somewhat satisfying uh, to, a, as a physicist, I, I enjoy a curve that is collapsed like that. Um, but I mean, really that's by design because we've used uh, the Dubai Waller time to make sure that that is the case. Um, so I just wanna show a subset of that data as a function of temperature, just to make it a little less abstract. So simulation data up here, and we're extrapolating down to these, uh, down to these experiments uh, down here. And you know, you can see it's, you know, pretty good fits really. Um, so that would be nice. Um, but the problem is there really isn't a way to predict the best Dubai Waller time, at least that, that we're aware of yet. Um, so this isn't predictive. Um, this is one attempt that I made <clears throat> at a simple relation to predict the Dubai Waller time. It's just, you know, a simple power, power law um, as a function of molecular weight. Um, so that, you know, that would be a really nice, simple uh, equation you could use to potentially predict um, this to buy Waller time, but it doesn't really work out that well. Um, so this is something that we're still sort of working on and interested in, but uh, I'd like to uh, sort of switch gears here uh, to a different approach that we started looking at recently. And that is the uh, time temperature superposition principle. Um, so this is widely used in uh, like polymer rheology. So this is an example of a dynamic mechanical analysis or DMA. So you have a machine that applies an oscillatory um, force to a polymer sample um, and it gives you, uh, here it's the storage modulus as a function of frequency. Um, so each machine, each DMA machine has sort of a limited frequency range that it can look at, but you can also change the temperature on these, on these machines. Um, and then the, the basic idea of uh, time temperature superposition is that time and temperature are interchangeable. So that is to say, um, uh, low temperatures are equal to high frequencies or um, vice versa. Uh, so the upshot is that you can take these curves as a function of temperature and just scale them or shift them horizontally and form this master curve um, as a function of a, a large range of frequency. Uh, I should say, you know, frequency is the inverse of time and hence time temperature superposition. So what we wanted to do here was apply the same general idea, but use it with the mean squared displacement. 
So take these curves and apply some scaling or shifting um, and then form a master curve. And you can see that we're actually able to do that with you know, reasonably, good, uh, reasonably good alignment between those. Um, so we chose a particular way of doing the scaling uh, based on some uh, work in the literature. So um, we chose this function of the Debye-Waller factor and the temperature uh, using some exponents to give us some, some knobs to control how much of, how much of the scaling, uh, how much the scaling depends on those two quantities. Um, it's important to have both the temperature. Uh, obviously the temperature has an effect on how quickly things move, in or move around, but it's important to also include the Debye-Waller factor because it encodes information both about the free volume distribution in the polymer, as well as uh, about like the size of the solute and how it interacts with the polymer. So the, combi the combination of those two things is, is important. Um, and then after doing the vertical scaling, the horizontal scaling is just chosen so that the curves fit together nicely at a particular time, T naught, which is another knob that we use to um, make the fits work out nicely. So uh, what we did then was to use, use those shifting factors and basically just find a single set of these three fitting parameters that, that allowed us to get good extrapolation from the uh, simulation data down to all of, all of these different experimental data points. And I know this plot on the left is very messy, a lot of lines there. So I just pulled out a few examples on the right that show that we have very good um, extrapolation for a wide variety of different systems. Um, so that's, you know, that's very nice. For all the um, systems we've looked at so far, this actually worked quite well. Um, there's still some work to be done here because we don't have any real understanding uh, of what these parameters mean, if there's any physical meaning or if they're just convenient fitting parameters. And uh, it'll be interesting to see in the future how well this applies to, uh, to other systems, I think. So just to summarize, um, at high temperature or for low molecular weight solutes, you can really uh, use MD uh, to get very accurate uh, predictions of the diffusivity. Um, uh, you can also use those high temperature simulations to sort of naively extrapolate to lower temperatures and that um, in some cases is predictive, but in most cases it provides an upper bound uh, estimate uh, on D. Um, and you know, there are some ways you can play around with this to try and make it a little bit uh, more predictive, but uh, it's, not, it's not super clear uh, what the best way is, is to do this uh, at this point, although we're still looking into that for sure. Um, and then lastly, we found recently that time temperature superposition seems to be a really promising method to get accurate predictions um, at physiological temperature. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank all of my coworkers um, and thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at this uh, email address here, and I will have a uh, some sort of session uh, to answer uh, anyone's questions on uh, Friday, November 20th, starting at 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. So thanks a lot, folks.